Russia's Su-57, Putin's first stealth fighter in service since December 2022, has been through a roller coaster of development woes and skepticism. Yet, despite its impressive tech, doubts remain about its true capabilities, especially its stealthiness. So, what's the deal with its long road to completion, and can it really slip under the radar like it claims? Let's dive in. Tom Cruise is no stranger to impossible missions. For several decades, perhaps with a bit of assistance from the Hollywood Special Effects Department, he has been fighting bad guys in fast-moving action sequences on sea, land, and in the air. In 1986, in the film Top Gun, he piloted a state-of-the-art fourth-generation US F-14 Tomcat against fictional Russian MiG-28s. In 2022, he returned to the cockpit of the by-now-out-of-date F-14 to dogfight against fifth-generation advanced Russian fighters. Cruz, in the guise of ace fighter pilot Pete Mitchell, manages to shoot down two enemy aircraft. He downs one of them the old-fashioned way, with a burst of cannon fire. Another member of his squadron manages to account for another one. In this second version of the film Top Gun, the plane the movie directors chose to represent the bad guys was a real aircraft, the Russian Su-57 single-seat multi-role stealth fighter. Since its original maiden flight back in 2010, this is a plane so rarely seen in the skies that it might almost be a fictional aircraft. Ironically, if Maverick and his buddies had shot down three Su-57s in real life, that would have probably accounted for the entire Russian serviceable fleet of stealth fighters. Joking aside, Russia's Su-57 fighter is Russia's first attempt to join a very exclusive club of nations, those that can boast a stealth fighter within their air force. Information is always a little bit hazy around Russian military equipment. We think the Su-57 officially became operational in December 2020. Until then, it was only China and the United States that had stealth fighters. The Su-57 has had a painful and protracted birthing process that has spanned decades, cost billions of rubles, and seen two of the aircraft written off in accidents before it was operational. It may have been used in combat against Ukraine in the last couple of years, but we only have the claims of the Kremlin and little in the way of independent confirmation. But the Su-57 certainly seems to be a high-tech and capable aircraft, and Western analysts have been taking a keen interest in its development. So why has it taken so long to develop? And is it any good? And perhaps more to the point, is it stealthy? Before we get to that, let's start with what seemed to be a promising origin story. Founded by Pavel Shukhoi in 1939, the Shukhoi Design Bureau has developed a long and proud tradition of producing combat aircraft in the service of first the Soviet Union and then Russia. Shukhoi produced fighter and ground attack aircraft during the Second World War. From 1945 onwards, the company embraced the new challenges in technologies offered by the arrival of the jet engine, producing fighters, bombers, and reconnaissance aircraft. Shukhoi also branched out into civilian aircraft. In 2006, the Russian government merged several aircraft companies into the United Aircraft Corporation. Shukhoi was part of this merger, alongside Mikoyan, Tupolev, Ilyushin, and several other legendary Russian aircraft designers and manufacturers. And thus, the development of the Su-57 began. Here's how it went down. Almost as soon as a new piece of high-technology military equipment comes into service, designers and planners are already looking ahead and thinking about its replacement. In the 1980s, the Soviet Union was looking ahead for the next generation of combat aircraft to provide the fighters of the 1990s and beyond. The concept was to have an aircraft capable of a range of tasks, able to attack targets in the air, on the land, and at sea. Experimental projects were initiated and some fell by the wayside amid cost increases and program delays. One fighter prototype only took to the air in 2000 and was, at that point, nine years behind schedule. The Russian Defense Ministry started afresh and in 1999 released a new set of requirements for a fighter aircraft that could, for cost reasons, replace both the MiG-29 and the Su-27, both sizable fleets of aircraft. It was intended that the aircraft should be smaller than its predecessors as well, to fit in with limited budgets. The Shukhoi development team took part in the invitation to submit proposals. It came down to a competition between Shukhoi and MiG. In April 2002, Shukhoi was selected and invited to produce prototypes, with an intended flying trial date somewhere in 2007. At the time, the aircraft design had a prototype name of the T-50. Shukhoi themselves are speculated to have used the American F-22 Raptor as a baseline guide for their design of a stealth fighter. The Shukhoi aspiration was for a family of stealth aircraft to emerge out of the Su-57 design work. 
Because much of the technology was very new, as the design of the aircraft proceeded, other aircraft were used as testbeds for aspects of the T-50, such as the weapons bays, engines, and flight control systems. Shukhoi made use of their own Su-27 multi-role fighter for this, and even retained some of these innovations on the Su-27 to make an upgraded Su-27. This proved so successful that the Russian Defense Ministry bought this new Su-27 version and renamed it the Su-35. The Su-35 is actually quite similar to the Su-57, apart from the stealth aspect, which the Su-57 reportedly has and the Su-35 does not. The project started to come together. The basic design was approved in 2004, and this triggered the release of more Defense Ministry funding into the project. In August 2007, the Russian Air Force announced the development was complete and that trials would soon be starting. The Soviet Union and Russia have marketed their military hardware all over the world. A fifth-generation stealth fighter aircraft would be no exception. Getting a large overseas order early on would take the financial pressures of the Su-57 project. India had bought much Russian military equipment in the past, and expressed very strong interest in acquiring the Su-57. There was talk of potential sales of two or three hundred aircraft. A deal was signed between Russia and India in 2010. But this is where cracks literally started to emerge in the program. A dozen flying and non-flying prototypes had been produced. Although flight testing and the maiden flight were due to begin in 2007, the flights were delayed. There were problems with the engines, flying trials were pushed back to 2010, and when they did take place, it soon became apparent that the airframe structure had significant problems. Stress cracks were appearing after only a few flights. The Shukhoi designers scrambled to find solutions and had to implement some major design adjustments in order to reinforce the basic aircraft structure. In June 2014, one of the prototypes caught fire just after landing. Although the pilot escaped unharmed, the aircraft was written off. Some of the parts and components were cannibalized for use with the other prototypes. The original plan had been to start delivering production versions of the Su-57 from 2015. This clearly was not going to happen. The delivery date slipped to 2020. During these unforeseen difficulties, the Russian government began to reassess and reduce its purchasing plans for the aircraft. The Russian Defense Ministry would buy 52 Su-57s by 2020 and then another 150 by 2025. But the program remained troubled, as purchasing plans and delivery dates all fluctuated. After Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea from Ukraine in 2014 and the subsequent low-intensity conflict in eastern Ukraine fought by Russian-backed separatists and covert Russian forces, international sanctions began to impact on Russian finances. The Russian defense industry relied on importing high-tech Western electronics and other equipment. These important components became harder to access on the open market. Sanctions were to become even tougher when Russia launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022. India started to back away from the big purchase order of Su-57s and in 2018 cancelled the deal completely. Large-scale production of what was a very expensive aircraft was now looking very doubtful. But in 2019, Russian President Vladimir Putin jumped in to tip the scales, perhaps even with his eye on a coming war with Ukraine. In May, the Kremlin released a statement that 76 Su-57s would be bought and would be delivered by 2028, but production of the aircraft remained slow. Reportedly, one was made in December 2020, and another four had emerged by the middle of 2022. Despite the problems, the aircraft had now flown publicly at air shows, and analysts had been able to take a look. The aircraft was light, maneuverable, and agile. Commentators were impressed. Marketing brochures and Kremlin official statements hyped up the capabilities, not least the fact that it was a stealth aircraft with long-range strike capability. But good intelligence analysts try not to take anything for granted. If it could do everything that the brochure advertised, the Su-57 would represent a very credible opponent for current US and NATO frontline fighter aircraft, such as the Eurofighter Typhoon, the F-22 Raptor, and the F-35 Lightning. But one former US pilot, Riley, observed, is it a current threat? Well, not now, because there is only one of them. Another ex-pilot observing the smooth takeoff and acrobatics of an Su-57 at an airshow was impressed but slightly dismissive of the fancy aerial display designed primarily to please the tourists. He was more interested in how the aircraft would perform with a full load of fuel and a heavy payload of weapons. Despite Putin's apparent faith in the aircraft, on December 24, 2019, the first official production-grade aircraft crashed while being delivered to an airbase. The pilot ejected and survived. The cause is unclear, 
but is believed to have been some form of control system malfunction. So what sort of capabilities have been advertised for the Su-57? The aircraft stats look impressive, reporting a speed of Mach 2 to 2.1 and a ceiling of 20,000 meters. A high fuel carrying capacity appears to give it a much longer range, 1,500 kilometers, just under 1,000 miles, than its Su-27 counterpart. It also has the option to fit an extendable refueling probe to further increase the range. Later production models are intended to receive a newly designed engine, the Isdalai 30, to deliver more power and performance. The Su-57 is capable of supercruise, maintaining flight speeds beyond Mach 1 without having to use high-fuel expensive afterburners. The Su-57 has six radars to enhance pilot situational awareness. The N036 Bielka radar has a range of 400 kilometers. The F-16, about to be received by Ukraine, only has a range of 300 kilometers. It can carry many different permutations of weapon types, missiles, cruise missiles, and bombs, enabling it to strike at ground, sea, and air targets. A GSH 30mm automatic cannon provides a small anti-air or air-to-ground attack capability. Apparently, hypersonic missiles are being designed with the Su-57 in mind. The infrared search and tracking system can handle multiple targets. But let's spend a little bit of time thinking about the main selling point for the Su-57 its stealth capability. Inevitably, these specialist skills are closely guarded state secrets, but we can make a few observations. A stealth aircraft is simply an aircraft that has been designed to make it harder for radar to hit the aircraft and bounce back to the radar receiver and produce a ping or a blip on the radar screen. This can be achieved with several careful shaping features to the plane's outline. The Su-57 aircraft has incorporated many measures indicative of stealth capability. The wing and control surfaces are carefully shaped and angled. For stealth missions, the weapons are carried in four internal weapons bays, rather than hanging off the outside of the aircraft, which would make the aircraft more radar visible. Large parts of the aircraft surface are treated with radar-absorbing material RAM. A key search and track sensor faces backwards when not in use, with the forward edge treated with RAM. The pilot canopy has been prepared with a metal oxide coating to reduce the radar profile. Extra care has been paid to every aspect of the assembly of the aircraft. Every rivet has to be flush with the fuselage or otherwise concealed. When assessing an aircraft's stealth capability, the experts talk of a radar cross-section. They mean what aircraft profile is visible to a radar system. By one estimate, the Su-57's radar cross-section, or RCS, is 30 times smaller than that of the Su-27. But some Western analysts suggest that although the frontal radar cross-section may be reasonably effective, the profile from the rear looks to be less well concealed. This would mean that it's probably harder to pick up on the radar if it's coming straight at you, but it might be more visible from the side or the rear. A crucial selling point for military hardware is whether you can point to a credible track record of military success. The Su-57 does not have this. Or does it? It's actually quite difficult to give a definitive answer. The Russian Defense Ministry has claimed that the Su-57 has been used in action in Syria and in Ukraine. This is hard to verify, but let's take a look at what we do know. Our journey begins in Syria. In late February of 2018, two Su-57s reportedly landed at the Kamaimim military airbase on Syria's Mediterranean coastline. Kamaimim is directly adjacent to the Basal al-Assad International Airport and, since 2015, has been effectively handed over to the Russians as part of their military operation in support of the Assad regime. It's well defended by Russian military personnel and air defense systems, and is a key logistics and accommodation node for Russian forces. The base has come under attack from shelling and drones in 2018. The Su-57s came accompanied by other aircraft, including Su-25s and 35s. Depending on the route taken, this could have been a flight of 1,000 kilometers or so, providing a good flight trial in its own right. It's possible that another couple of Su-57s also arrived at Kamaimim a few days later. What the Su-57s did there is unclear. It may simply have been a public relations exercise to demonstrate Russian capabilities and global reach. The aircraft were only there for a few days. After they departed, the Russian government made reference in March to Su-57 combat trials in Syria and claimed on 25th of May that an Su-57 had fired a cruise missile in combat. Later that year, the Russian Defense Ministry released footage of the Su-57s in flight and stated that 10 flights had taken place. It seems highly likely that the Su-57s dipped their toes into the Syrian conflict, but overall, this looks more like a PR stunt 
than a serious military deployment. Okay, but what about Ukraine? Russian claims that the Su-57 has been active during the invasion of Ukraine have been more persistent, but equally difficult to prove. Although it might seem a bit of a no-brainer that the Russian military would want to use their best aircraft in a large-scale war on their border, using the Su-57 over Ukraine would be fraught with military and reputational dangers. According to estimates, there are perhaps 10 to 15 Su-57 aircraft in total. It's fair to assume that not all of these would be operationally ready at any one point in time. This amounts to a very small potential strike force and one that could not realistically afford to lose more than one or two in combat. Multiple Russian sources started claiming that the Su-57 was used in action during the war, from two or three weeks after the start of the invasion. On 22nd of June 2022, Russian state media referred to the Su-57 combat operations in relation to Ukraine. On the 5th of November 2023, Russian media claimed that the Su-57s had been active over Luhansk, a region of Russian-controlled eastern Ukraine. Perhaps more credibly, the British Ministry of Defense Intelligence Group have assessed that the Su-57 has almost certainly been used in the war. Okay, so what could this mean? The Russian Air Force has suffered catastrophic losses during its invasion of Ukraine. According to plausible estimates, well over 300 aircraft from a Russian Air Force operational strength pre-war of around 900 aircraft. The Ukrainian air defense system has greatly improved during the conflict and now presents a very effective shield against Russian aerial encroachment. This looks likely to have caused the Russian Air Force to limit the amount of aircraft it risks to actually fly over Ukrainian territory. It is likely that US and NATO intelligence-gathering aircraft operating over NATO or international airspace in Eastern Europe are scooping up as much information as possible regarding Russian air deployment activities and operations and relaying this to the Ukrainian Defense Ministry. Many Russian air attacks are now conducted from Russian aircraft firing long-range missiles from Russian airspace. But even this does not make them entirely safe. Ukrainian air defense weapons include the Patriot, which has a range of 50 to 100 miles. Drones and other missiles also put Russian aircraft at risk on their bases inside Russia. So it's likely that Russia is remaining highly cautious with the Su-57 over Ukraine, not wishing to overplay their hand and expose it to undue risk. From what we've seen so far, the Su-57 is being used to undertake just enough aerial activity to be able to claim operational experience, but not enough to use it in a serious way that might knock out key Ukrainian military targets by using its stealth capability. If an Su-57 crashed in Ukraine, it would be a major propaganda blow for Russia and potentially a rich source of technological and tactical intelligence information made available to the Ukrainians and their Western allies. The views from the Ukrainian military suggest they certainly do not rule out the possibility that the Su-57 has been deployed in some way. One Ukrainian colonel observed that it's hard to identify specific aircraft types from the radar screen. The Su-25 and Su-35 can conduct similar non-stealth attacks with a similar profile. The colonel may know a little more than he's letting on. Perhaps the only real proof that a Russian stealth fighter was operating over Ukraine would be if a Ukrainian ground target suddenly exploded and the Ukrainians were at a complete loss to explain who had done it. That would be the perfect demonstration of a stealth attack. Conversely, however, if a Russian stealth attack was seen on the radar and easily intercepted, the Su-57's credibility would be instantly blown. So the question is, does Mr. Putin feel lucky? One thing's for sure, it's been a troubled path for Shukhoi's fifth-generation stealth fighter, and unfortunately for Russia's Su-57 program, it looks to be having very similar problems to the Russian T-14 next-generation main battle tank program, which we covered in one of our previous episodes. Both projects have struggled with design issues, have little to show for several decades of effort, and are now struggling with funding, technology, and a lack of crucial overseas sales. There are very few, only handfuls really, of the equipment known to be in existence, and no convincing demonstrations that either the aircraft or the tank are operationally ready in any meaningful sense. But work is still ongoing. Shukhoi is developing an Su-57 upgrade, known as the Su-57M. Flight trials of the Su-57M reportedly took place in 2022. There has been talk of a smaller naval version capable of landing on an aircraft carrier, but Russia does not have a viable carrier force at present. Perhaps of more immediate interest, in July 2021 there was reporting that a two-seater variant of the Su-57 was being built. This was described as a training version, but also something that might provide for a weapons officer to operate unmanned aerial vehicles or drones. 
Drone technology is causing something of a revolution in military affairs, due in large part to the innovations emerging from the Ukrainian battlefield. This is definitely something to keep an eye on. There is little concrete evidence that the international arms community have been wowed by the arrival of the Su-57. Although international sanctions are unlikely to shut down the Su-57 program, lack of critical technology, funds, and buyers will likely continue to restrict the forward progress of the Su-57 project. Potential sales opportunities still look limited. Brazil dropped out in 2013, preferring to buy the Swedish Gripen and build it in Brazilian factories. India cancelled its deal with Russia over five years ago and is looking to build its own homegrown stealth fighter. Turkey was briefly interested. In 2019, an Su-57 turned up at a Turkish technology display in Istanbul, but announced in early 2020 that it too was now planning to build a homegrown stealth fighter. Algeria may receive some in a few years' time, and Iraq has expressed interest, but they will probably be watching Ukraine closely for evidence of the much-promoted stealth capability. But not all technological innovations leap straight from the drawing board and into a fully functioning and successful piece of equipment. We suggest that it would be too simplistic to write off the Su-57. It is a light, powerful and agile aircraft with significant capabilities beyond other current Russian combat aircraft. And some of the new design and technological features that emerged from Shukhoi's extensive development efforts seem to have cascaded down to the benefit of other Russian fighter systems. So perhaps we need to wait and see what happens later this year. F-16 fighters have been offered to the Ukrainian Air Force by Denmark and Norway. These will replace the aging Ukrainian MiG-29 and Su-27 fighters. Ukrainian pilots are already being trained on F-16s, and we may well see them take to the skies over Ukraine even as soon as this summer. But what do you think? Is it possible the Russian Air Force is holding back its small Su-57 fleet in anticipation of a conflict with American aircraft technology? This would suddenly take us beyond a Hollywood movie and into a real contest between American fourth-generation aircraft and Russian fifth-generation. Is this likely to happen? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from Military Experts.